and this is the 11.15 study on Monday morning. We want now to go back to the great controversy and continue our study of the developing crisis which is facing the world, which will bring the most massive problems that this world has ever seen. And there is an accumulation of trouble. So far, of course, we've been looking particularly at the the harvest of trouble which comes from the seed sowing of disobedience. They sow disobedience and they reap disobedience. <coughs> and disobedience, of course, means the proliferation of criminals and their work, uh, uh, terrorism, immorality, violence, and such like we see increasing today in the streets of the great cities. But now this opens another door, and that is to um, spiritualism. I turn to page 588 and page 589 to note these words in regard to this rising power. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They'll reach over the abyss to clasp hands of the Roman power and under the influence of these, this threefold union this country will follow in the steps of Roman trampling on, on the rights of conscience. We tend to think of spiritualism as being something in a dark room, tables floating around and uh, spirit mediums bringing up all kinds of dead and departed relatives and such like, and that is a form of spiritualism. But it's by no means the most deceptive form. The most deceptive form is its presence in the Protestant churches and its preaching through the mighty preachers in those Protestant churches. The next paragraph says, As spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and to ensnare. So the, the um, manifestation of spiritualism is an imitation or a just imitation of the nominal Christianity of today. And if I was to take time to study this thing through with you, we'd soon demonstrate the fact that the work of men like Billy Graham, for instance, and these other men is literally a manifestation of spiritualism. And of course, millions upon millions of folk think it's the mighty work of God. Let me, but perhaps I'll read you one statement to confirm that fact on page 464, page 464 in this same book, Great Controversy. It's in the chapter entitled Modern Revivals. And uh, this statement has long impressed my mind and makes very clear the fact that spiritualism today manifests itself in the fallen churches. Notwithstanding the widespread declension of faith and piety, there are true followers of Christ in these churches, and that is of course the Protestant fallen churches. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children, at that time many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and his word. Many, both the ministers and people, will gladly accept these great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to repair a appeal for the Lord's second coming. Now so far this has shown us, it says before the final visitation of God's judgments, and the final visitation of God's judgments of course are the seven last plagues. And before that time, the spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children and we have what we generally term the latter rain, which produces, of course, the loud cry. Now, during that time, there will be thousands upon thousands will accept the truth of God. But then it goes on to say, before the time, well, first of all, the enemy of souls desires to hinder this work, that is the work of the latter rain, before the time, which is back here, of course, um, that's the place for a moment for such a movement shall come he will endeavour to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit so back here then we have the false latter rain or the counterfeit latter rain now page 593 in Great Controversy says that so closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures Right? 
Now I want now to go on to demonstrate the fact that this counterfeit is a manifestation of spiritualism. Let's read the next few words on page 464. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exalt that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Now, let's look at the board a moment. When this false reformation goes forward, this counterfeit loud cry goes forward, this counterfeit of the real thing, Satan will make it appear that God's special blessing is being poured out when it is the work of another spirit. Now what, what do we call the work of this other spirit? Spiritualism. Right? Spiritualism. So that um, an added, I go back to page 589 now in the book Great Controversy, but, but, an, but an added development of the laying aside of God's Ten Commandment law and, and God's moral precepts and God's principles and God's ways is that not only do men find that there is the proliferation of iniquity but also the advancement of the power of spiritualism. So spiritualism begins to manifest itself in increasing power in the world. Now through spiritualism Satan begins to control the elements. Let's now read a little further. Now, what I'm trying to show is that there's a many um, uh, that, that, that problems, uh, complicated problems, problems which, which reach into every facet of human life, into moral behaviour, into their spiritual lives, and into the natural and economic world. So there's no phase of human human life which is not engulfed in this last great problem situation which is developing in the world and it all goes back to the root cause of the laying aside of God's message and God's truth. Now when we recognise the relationship between this cause and these effects, it should surely impress upon our minds the advisability of turning aside from the same cause so we learn to esteem God's commandments and obey them and that's why of course another reason why to the Philadelphian church Jesus Christ is presented as the Holy One or the obedient and faithful one let's turn now to page 589 in the book Great Controversy to read this point through spiritualism Satan appears as a benefactor of the race healing the diseases of the people and professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith but at the same time he works as a destroyer he works as a destroyer through what means? Through spiritualism. Which has gained greater power because of the setting aside of God's divine law. I read on. His temptations are leading multitudes to ruin. Intemperance to thrones reason, sensual indulgence, strife and bloodshed follow. Satan delights in war, for he excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another for he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. So we can put down um, spiritualism now generates wars. Okay. And we now read of course that it also generates weather problems and weather problems generate economic problems as we're well aware, of course, down in America this year, there, ha there have been some fearful problems with long protracted dry periods. How crops have failed on the one hand through drought and the other hand through hopeless flooding. And um, so when we find the weather problems um, become significant, we have economic problems because the crops fail. And when the crops fail, of course, there's eventual starvation of both man and beast. Farmers find that they are ruined because they have no income for their for their work so there's a very close connection between these two so I'll read further Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls he has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows when he was suffered to afflict Job how quickly flocks and herds servants, houses, children were swept away one trouble succeeding another as in a moment. 
It is God that shields his creatures and hedges them in from the power to destroy it. But the Christian world has shown contempt for the law of Jehovah and the Lord will do just what he has declared that he would. He will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Satan has control of all whom God does not especially guard. He will favour and prosper some in order to finish further his own designs and he will bring trouble upon others and lead them to believe that God that it is God who is afflicting them. While appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves and earthquakes. In every place in a thousand forms Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He impasses to the air a deadly taint and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The haughty people do languish. The earth, is, the earth also is defiled and the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. <clears throat> Isaiah 24 verses 4 and 5. Now this prophecy was written something like uh, 70 years ago the, the last edition of Great Controversy came out in 1911 so it's a 70 year old prophecy now can we say today that these things are being fulfilled before our very eyes yes. right do we find that all these disasters and troubles are getting worse and worse yes. and was there every year now worse than this year no. in fact I remember watching a, uh, a newscast about March I think this year and I was amazed to find that there were five great disasters reported in just one new newscast. For instance, there was a, a serious drought in Australia. There were floods, I think, in Virginia or in the Mississippi Valley at that time. You may remember them earlier in the year. There was a, a great pileup on uh, a freeway in France when, when hundreds of cars were involved in, in this pileup in fog. There was a, uh, an earthquake somewhere and a volcanic eruption somewhere else, all in one newscast. And I said, well, I said, that's rather extraordinary. But to my amazement, the next, next day, there was a couple more somewhere else. And so, and so this year, they, they've come with such frequency that every newscast seems to contain a disaster somewhere in the world, earthquakes, tidal waves, volcanoes, floods, droughts, whatever the, whatever the case might happen to be. And uh, this has to be to us a sign that the end is rapidly drawing near. And um, the time will shortly come when the final battle should be fought. Now, as these disasters and troubles become greater and greater and greater, at the same time, spiritualism is working to unify the churches. Right? And um, today that the work of unification is going on with steady progress. So there'll be, there'll be the unification of the churches in preparation for their stepping into the position which they are aiming to occupy at the head of mankind in the very near future. Now a time is soon coming when the Protestant churches in this country, in Canada and also back in America, unified, are going to offer to the, to the people of this world a solution to their problem. Which, which will be professedly a solution coming from God but in fact will come entirely and only from mankind. There's a parallel to this in the story of Jezebel and Ahab back in the Old Testament. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 21 and um, let's see how the experience in which they passed back there is also a type of the final showdown between the... Um, the, the Jacob people and the Esau people. First Kings chapter 21. This is the story of Naboth the Jezreelite and the vineyard. Now I pick on this story because in Revelation chapter 2 we read about Jezebel in the fire and church. 
We also read about that woman seated upon the scarlet coloured beast in Revelation chapter 17. Now what is the name of that woman in Revelation chapter 17? She is called Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, right? That's what she's called. But we can also ask the question, what is her other name? What is her typical name? Jezebel, right? Jezebel. Now, if the Roman Catholic system in the middle of the Dark Ages was called Jezebel, what will that same system be called at the end of time? Jezebel, the same thing. And therefore, just as surely as Jezebel is that woman, what is the name of the beast upon which she rides? The beast being, of course, the kings of this earth. Who is the king in the Jezebel story? Ahab, right? So let's see, let's see Jezebel as being the queen who rides upon Ahab's back or upon this beast in Revelation chapter 17. And then let's go back to the story in 1 Kings 21 to see how the type and the anotype meet and, um, and coalesce in the last days of human history. 1 Kings 21, start with verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel hard by the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke to Naboth saying Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herms because it is near unto my house and I will give you a better vineyard for it if it seem good to you. I will give you the worth of it in money. Now, what impresses me is the fact that this despotic ruler, King Ahab, was so polite about the whole business, wasn't he? So decent, so fair, so reasonable. He said, okay, so give me the vineyard and I'll buy it from you or give you a better one, whatever you like. It's up to you, you take your pick. Well, those two options didn't suit me, but he said, neither, I'll, I'll, I'll keep the vineyard. Now, we have to recognize the fact that down in these last days, the leaders of false religion will be models of courtesy and propriety. They'll be polite, they'll be fair, they'll be generous even, and they'll look like angels, but in fact be what? Devils. devils, right? They'll look like angels, but in fact they'll be devils. Now the reason why Naboth would not surrender his vineyard was not because he was being difficult, not because he was being selfish, but because it was a very, very clear-cut command from God that a that an inheritance was not to pass into the hands of another tribe because if it did of course it would completely mess up the borders of Israel and uh, you find for instance to be a little bit of um, Judah way over in the middle of Benjamin or a bit of uh, Issachar way over in the middle of Naphtali and very soon there would be just such a, such a mess that they wouldn't know where they were and so Naboth was concerned with obeying God's commandments and therefore he was a man who exhibited a certain degree of holiness he obeyed the commands of God. He said, what are my orders? And his orders were not to sell the vineyard into another tribal possession. Therefore, Ahab, even though he was king, did not qualify to receive that vineyard. Now, as a result of this, <clears throat> Ahab found himself with a problem which he couldn't solve, right? He, he found himself with a problem which he could not solve. Now, in like manner, the political forces in these last days more and more are being uh, exposed, that's what I want, are being exposed as as being inept at solving the problems that are developing in this world. Mm -hmm. Right? Much, so much so <clears throat> that the voters don't know what to do much anymore. Now, for instance, down in Australia, a few years ago, we had the Labour Party in power and they made such a horrifying mess of the country. They made, made such blunders that um, I don't think will ever be wiped out so far as far as history is concerned. And the people in their disgust of that party then threw them out of office with the most resounding vote ever given to the Labour Party and they put the Liberal Party into power with such a huge majority it was predicted there would be many, many years before the Labour would ever get back in again. But only a few years go by, about eight or nine years, and this year we had the reversal of that thing. In other words, the people said, all right, we, we, we tried you and you failed, and then we'll try the other guys and see what happens there, and they, they're going to fail for certain and bring more trouble than they're worth upon the nation. And so, as, as the political party, parties pass on, uh, find themselves faced with greater and greater problems, the time is going to come when people shall lose all faith in political parties entirely. They almost have now, haven't they? Yeah. Almost. <clears throat> now, another 
factor against the political parties is the fact that they're so divided, even within themselves they're divided. Now, for instance, in Queensland, I've heard since I've been away, the Liberal and Country parties, two different parties, who have pretty much the same platform of uh, policies, ruled in the state uh, government in Queensland for many decades because they united, or what they call it, they, they had a coalition government. But recently they have, well in the last 12 months they've been fighting so much amongst themselves that these two are split, split now, and election is coming up in October I believe, and there's no way in the world that a split party is going to get back into power, which is very unfortunate in my view for Queensland. And so the Labor Party will certainly gain power in Queensland, I would say, in the coming election because of this divisiveness or divisiveness within the political parties themselves. Now, by contrast, the world will be offered a united church, and a united church where, there, where no more divisions, all the old divisions have been sold, and when the churches will demonstrate that they have solved their problems and put away all their differences and now are united, will that not recommend them as being the most eligible force in the world to be the great problem-solving factor in modern human history? Yeah. Right? A united church under one leader, the Pope obviously, of course, uh, will offer itself as the nation's problem solver. Jezebel, in other words, will come forward as the world's problem solver and they will say, we are a united people. We are one people. We've solved our problems and obviously, of course, if we've solved ours, we can solve yours. Okay? So, come back to Jezebel now and see what she did back there at that time. <coughs> Verse 5, 1 Kings 21. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said to him, Why is thy spirit so sad and that, thou canst not, that thou eatest no bread? And he said to her, Because I spake to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. So, Jezebel, so Ahab said, I've got a problem I can't solve. Now remember, Ahab symbolize the kingship or politics okay let's put Ahab over here then <coughs> okay so he was the king and therefore he symbolized the political power today or oh, here's the beast on which in the last days the woman sits and rides and Jezebel what does she symbolize the church ruthless and so forth and the church as the problem solver. Now Ahab couldn't solve the problem so he was not able to occupy that position. But Jezebel came along and said, I will solve your problems. Now note this point with care. In order for her to solve his problem, she took his power to do it. Right? So it's the same power. The same power the political parties have wielded all this time but with a different manager. Right? Same power, different manager. Whereas, the, whereas the, the presidents and so forth wielded that power before, now the churches will wield that power. And in these last days, they will say to the people, and therefore to the state, give us your power and we will solve your problems. Can you see it coming? Yes. Very clearly. <clears throat> now what should the churches say in the last days? The churches who profess to be the mouthpiece of God... They should say to the people, let's get right down to the roots of our problem. Let's go back to the Word of God. There was a book in circulation called The Sabbath Rest, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> and what they should say to the people is, pardon my little, my little joke, but that's quite seriously what they should say, by the way. They should take that book and print millions of copies and give it to all the people around the world and say, now live by this and we'll have no more problems. God will have them instead. Now the, now the churches should say to the state and to the people, look, all this trouble we now have is caused by our rejection of truth when the gospel came to us back in 1843. And when that first angel's message came, we turned it down, we threw out the law and the Sabbath together, this has opened the floodgates of iniquity upon the world, it's let spiritualism in, and all the wars and weather problems and economic disasters we now have all that comes from a rejection of God's word back here. So in order to escape, or in order to have our problems solved, we've got to go right back to the root of our trouble and get, it, get that straightened out, and then, give, and then God can take care of all these problems. Now, are they about to do that? 
Now, why in the world? They're not going to do that. That's the last thing they're going to do because their hearts are set against the truth of God. <clears throat> Instead, the churches are going to say, we, not God, but we will solve your problems provided we have your power. And that's why the woman rides upon the beast in Revelation chapter 17. Because the beast is the, uh, the power by which the woman moves about her business and does what she wants to do. Now, of course, initially it will seem that this is a grand scheme. The people will say with a great... Because um, every, uh, every time the people get behind some new political party, they, they have full confidence that that party is going to do for them what they have not had done for them before. This is going to be the answer. This time things are going to go through, and this time it will be a, a very optimistic and positive uh, uh, outworking. But... Um, and so likewise, when, when this grand union of churches with one benign pope at the head um, claiming to be God's agents upon the earth and, and declaring with the greatest possible assurance that they're going to solve all human problems and they'll preach about the coming into this glorious millennium of peace upon this earth, how will the people regard this grand and wonderful scheme? With enthusiasm? with confidence it, the great peace and safety cry will go forth which precedes of course sudden destruction and uh, people will just be agog with excitement and uh, confidence and enthusiasm at last they found the secret a united church has arisen to lead them into God's peace secure now will we as God's people knowing what we now know about the Sabbath rest principles will we recognize in an instant the very the very certainty that this thing will lead not to solution but to even worse problems right we understand the very nature of this scheme we recognize that the the the, the, uh, the evil foundations upon which it's laid <coughs> we recognize that men will not have learned from history the lessons of history and knowing all the sabbath rest principles and being filled with the awesome power of god's spirit so our arguments become extremely powerful and skilled and penetrating we rise up and we condemn that system from its top to its bottom right right to the very heart of it will expose the whole thing now when such an exposure takes place <clears throat> thousands upon thousands of folks are going to recognize the truth of these arguments and they will remove their support from this great system <clears throat> but what will the majority do how will the majority regard us at that time as a th dangerous yeah. a threat is the word I'm looking for dangerous is just as good heresy. yes heresy but as a threat that's the, that's the important word right no question about that <clears throat> now the people will say we've worked for a long time to come to this place uh, this is the culmination of all the efforts of 6,000 well in their case of course they've been millions of years of human history but they'll think that this is the culmination this is the great enlightenment the great um, renaissance the great uh, emergence they'll think of this as being at last they have arrived they will say and you stubborn and stiff back little group of people down there are going to spoil the party mm -hmm. they'll think see they regard us as being the supreme threat exactly as Esau regarded Jacob to be the threat to his birthright when Jacob was coming back from Mesopotamia so in the last days the wicked will regard us as being the threat to all this grand scheme and they're not going to permit anything to spoil what they have worked so long to develop <coughs> and Jezebel therefore will rise up to destroy the people of God at that time exactly as Esau went out to destroy Jacob now we'll come back to the story of Jacob now to trace a little further before we draw any more parallels but, but, but before we do can you see how the course of, of the Esau people in the last days bring them up to this point of crisis just as the course of Esau did back there in his day now then we come on to um, I'm going to pass over the experience of Jacob in um, Mesopotamia when he um, when he uh, w became married to two wives because of the deception practiced by Laban and uh, I should mention of course that there, there came a time when Jacob did become a born again Christian and that was after he had seen the wonderful vision of the of the um, uh, ladder which went from earth up to heaven 
I'll read this on page 184 in passing. It says, um, The Lord knew the evil influences that would surround Jacob and the perils to which he would be exposed. In mercy he opened up the future before the repentant fugitive that he might understand the divine purpose with reference to himself and be prepared to resist the temptations that would surely come to him when alone amid idolaters and scheming men. There would be ever before him the high standard at which he must aim and the knowledge that through him the purpose of God was reaching its accomplishment would constantly prompt him to faithfulness. In this vision the plan of redemption was presented to Jacob, not fully but in such parts as were essential to him at that time. The mystic ladder revealed to him in his dream was the same to which Christ referred in his conversation with Nathaniel. Said he, you have seen heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. <laughs> Up to the time of man's rebellion against the government of God, there had been free communion between God and man. So there's comments about the ladder there, but I'm looking particularly um, for the fact that Jacob at this point began to grasp the promise of God for himself and to become a true Christian accordingly. All this was revealed to Jacob in a dream. Although his mind had once grasped a part of the revelation as great and mysterious truth of the state of his lifetime and unfolded his understanding more and more. And this is more or less the time when Jacob gained a true new birth experience as a result of that, uh, of that dream. For instance, on page um, 188 we read, with a new and abiding faith in the, in the divine promises and assured of the presence and guardianship of heavenly angels, Jacob pursued his journey to the land of the children of the east, which of course was the land of Mesopotamia. Well, let's come across now to the time when the command of God was given to him to return back to his own country again. And um, we know, of course, that um, Laban pursued after him. I turn now to page 192. First of all, Jacob said to Laban, let me go. Send me away that I may go to my own country and to my own place. But Laban said, no, you can't go. But because Laban recognized that Jacob's presence was a source of prosperity to him at that present time. Now, in like manner today, the presence in this world of God's faithful and true people is the one factor which, which assures the wicked of their continued existence. That if the... Um, presence of God's folk was, was withdrawn from this earth, the result would be of course that um, the wicked would, would suffer destruction and so in one sense of course the wicked are reluctant to see us go if they really, and would be more so if they really knew what our presence was doing to them. But as time went by, the sons of, Jacob, sons of Laban rather became more and more jealous of Jacob's prosperity and finally God said to Jacob go back to your own country. i read this down from page 193. Jacob would have left his crafty kinsman long before but for the fear of encountering Esau. Now he felt that he was in danger from the sons of Laban who looking upon his wealth as their own might endeavour to secure it by violence. It was in their... Uh, he was in great perplexity and distress not knowing which way to turn. But mindful of the gracious Bethel promise, he carried his case to God and sought direction from him. In a, in a dream his prayer was answered, Return unto the land of your fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. Now this command is a very important part of the story. A very important part of the story. Note that when he had this problem, Jacob said, What shall I do? He sought direction from God. Now Jacob could, of course, integrate it into the family of Laban. It was now a family relationship. He married two of Laban's daughters, namely Leah and Rachel. And um, he could very easily have let their customs become his customs and become just a part of the family, which would have suited Laban very nicely and the brothers would have not minded one little bit. But Jacob absolutely refused to become a part of their idolatry and wickedness. And he had his eyes set, of course, on the heavenly, uh, heavenly objective, the heavenly country. Now I can see in that experience a very clear parallel of our experience because we were in Laban's house when we, when we were back in the Seventh Day Adventist Church and we could easily remain there and become integrated into their system of religion and their idolatry and so forth. But we refused to be that and we went to God with our problem pleading for an answer to our difficulties and God gave us this message 
and this message was one a message of deliverance from sin but was also a call to leave this world and get out or not get out but, but, get, but to turn back on the heavenly journey toward the heavenly Canaan right and that's where we're going now isn't it? we're moving toward that heavenly objective under Christ's personal leadership now when God gave to him the order return to the land of your fathers from that point on Jacob should have rested in the assurance that nothing could go wrong that he would be brought safely and successfully to his own land again but despite that fact of course and particularly because Jacob remembered his sin when he sinned against his brother back there many years before and remembering that Jacob had some very very anxious moments along the way as we shall now learn and in learning this, of course, we will um, we will learn what our experience of life was going to be during the coming time of trouble. So I turn now to page 195 in the same book, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, and um, read the following. Though Jacob had left Paddan Aram in obedience to the divine direction, it was not without many misgivings that he retraced the road which he had trodden as a fugitive many, 20 years before. His sin in the deception of his father was ever before him. He knew that his long exile was a direct result of that sin and he pondered over these things day and night, the reproaches of an accusing conscience making his journey very, very sad. As the hills of his native land appeared before him in the distance, the heart of the patriarch was deeply moved. All the past rose vividly before him. With the memory of his sin came also the thought of God's favour toward him and the promise of divine help and guidance. The promises, rather, of divine help and guidance. Now, <clears throat> Jacob's trouble, as I said before, was very definitely as the result of his own sin in scheming to get that birthright for himself instead of waiting patiently for God to give that birthright to him. That was the... Um, that was the, uh, the sin which, which Jacob had committed and now he was to suffer for that sin now as he came back toward the promised land again the memory of that sin was an accusing conscience which made him fear that God would not be able to work for him as mightily, mightily as he otherwise might have done now, we are to learn from Jacob's experience not to let that thing happen to us we've made mistakes in the past we've made plenty of mistakes in the past too many of them as a matter of fact but remember this, that when God forgives you for those sins, you stand before God as if you had never committed them at all. And when Satan comes and starts to impose upon us the memory of our wrongs in the past and to condemn us for those wrongs, we are to say to him, now look, old devil, you and I are not on speaking terms. This is not my problem. God has forgiven those sins. If you want to make a case about them, you go and talk to him about them. Don't bother me. I'm not interested. But Jacob apparently allowed his mind to dwell upon those things and he, he did parley with Satan to a large extent and consequently had a very, very troubled journey back toward the heavenly mansions. Now I know it's not easy, of course, to throw away that feeling of guilt and condemnation, especially when Satan is there letting it on to us as hard as he possibly can. But if we will learn to rebuke the devil, he will flee from us. And remember, you're not on speaking terms with him. At least I hope you're not. <laughs> if you are, you shouldn't be. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> when you find that old mistakes there is brought up before you and you feel that, that sense of depression because of it, just, just immediately say to the devil, run along and talk to God about that. Don't bother me with it. And you find it works. It really does work. And Satan loses his power to annoy and to tempt us at that, at that point of time. Now, as um, Jacob progressed, of course, God in his great kindness gave him some mighty assurances of forgiveness and protection, which ought to have been enough to compose the troubled spirit of that man. Let's read a little further now. As he drew nearer his journey's end, the thought of Esau brought many a trouble foreboding. After the flight of Jacob, Esau had regarded himself as the sole heir of their father's possessions. The news of Jacob's return would excite the fear that he would, was coming to claim the inheritance. Esau was now able to do his brother great injury if so disposed and he might be moved to violence against him not only for the, by the desire for revenge but in order to secure undisturbed possession of the wealth which is so long looked upon as his own. Again the Lord granted Jacob a token of the divine care. 
as he travelled southward from Mount Gilead, two hosts of heavenly angels seemed to cover him behind them before, advancing with his company as if for their protection. Jacob remembered the vision at Bethel so long before, and his burdened heart grew lighter at this evidence that the divine messengers who had brought him hope and courage at his flight from Canaan were to be the guardians of his return. And he said, This is God's host. And he called the, place, the name of that place Mahanaim, two hosts or camps. Yet Jacob felt that he has something to do to secure his own safety. Now, I, I, I think that this sentence reveals, of course, that Jacob had not fully learned yet to totally and completely rest in God. And because of that, he spent that time fighting against God during that night when Jesus Christ came down to struggle with him and to bring him to a point of final surrender, a final deliverance from the long-standing disposition to devise ways and means of saving himself. Note the words again, yet Jacob felt that he had something to do to secure his own safety. Well, I to, to support my point, I'll just run quickly across to page 197, and uh, this sentence or two describes what happened by the end of Jacob's struggle with the angel. <clears throat> The error which had led to Jacob's sin in, in obtaining the birthright by four was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but had sought by his own efforts to bring about that which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. In other words, at what point of time did Jacob finally come to understand that his mistake had been to scheme and devise to get that birthright blessing for himself? It was after the struggle with the angel in the darkness of that, of that night, right? That's when he saw it. That's when he saw it. So therefore, even, even when he was entering into this confrontation with Esau, there was still in Jacob a residue of the old spirit of doing something himself to save himself. Let's read those words again. Yet, <clears throat> Jacob felt... He has something to do to secure his own safety. He therefore dispatched messengers with a conciliatory greeting to his brother. He instructed them to as to the exact words in which they were to address Esau. And um, the address was, of course, uh, my lord Esau and thy servant Jacob to reassure his brother that he was not coming back to be a threat. That, uh, and furthermore, he sent a large gift of animals to his brother to indicate the fact that he was not a poor man and he was not coming back to take the birthright blessing. And finally, of course, Esau was convinced of that fact. Now, I have to leave it just about there because our time has gone, but when we come back this afternoon, we'll study, we'll study very carefully the actual struggle between Christ and Jacob and we'll learn uh, what Jacob uh, achieved or what Christ achieved I should say in the life of Jacob through this struggle and from that we'll learn exactly what the nature of the struggle against God will be during the time of Jacob's trouble as far as we're concerned and what we can do today to minimise that struggle when that time comes and that will be a very very important lesson one of the most important lessons of the entire week so don't miss the next study period <laughs> that, that was the commercial <laughs> Good, let's close the study period. Are there any questions you'd like to ask in respect to this presentation this morning? Right then, let's take our closing hymn. <clears throat>